mug, November 2015. And every so often I go on this periodic rant about SSH and how you're not using it right. So, um, I'm going to start off with a, a couple questions here because uh, yesterday I got curious and I wondered who was giving the talk, the, the other talk tonight at the meeting. And there was nobody listed. So I reached out to Jim, and he said, oh, no, you've got the whole evening. <laughs> so, uh, 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 yes, yes, lucky me. Fortunately, this is boiled down from a four-hour course, so I have a ready source of slides. Uh, but uh, I, I'm going to risk throwing all of my slides away and ask a couple of questions here. How many of you folks are using... Passwords with SSH. I'll admit it. Sometimes. Sometimes. So, sometimes it's okay. Okay. I may skip through some parts of this because many of you uh, are already decent people and have stopped using passwords and making the internet a worse place. So, um, I wrote a book on SSH. It's small. It's uh, it's printed on thin, soft paper for easy recycling. Uh, I'm also a founding member of, of the brand new Southeast Michigan BSD user group, semibug.org. Uh, the web page will give you uh, visual poisoning. You have been warned. So, let's talk about SSH in general. It's a tool, like a hammer, like a saw. Like any tool, it can be used for good or evil. How many of you folks have been in a corporate security audit where SSH was an issue for the auditor? A lot of auditors don't like this particular hammer because it's really good at breaking holes in walls. Um, on the other hand, when everything goes completely to hell, SSH can help you glue your network back together again and save the day. So, I'm going to talk about tools and techniques tonight. Uh, SSH responsibly. Uh, if your organization has rules against opening a tunnel out to the internet and browsing uh, porn sites without going through the corporate proxy, Please obey that rule. Uh, or <coughs> decide ahead of time that you really don't care about the job because apparently this is a great time to be job hunting. <laughs> so, anytime I give a talk having anything to do with authentication, somebody asks about password managers. And the talk for the next 15 to 20 minutes degenerates into this argument over which is the best and which is worse. And are these even a good idea? So, uh, NANOG, the North American Network Operators Group, uh, is one of the best groups of actual hands-on network and networking practitioners today. Uh, and the general consensus on that list is that the best password manager is KeePass. I've answered the question. Please don't ask it again. Thank you. I'm gonna. Why is it the best? I'm gonna steer you to the Nanog mailing list archives, because this discussion destroyed the list for nearly six months, and there is more detail than you could possibly want to know. So, uh, I'm gonna speed through a couple slides here. Encryption 101. Plain text is the readable stuff. 
Uh, if you can't read plain text, you have another problem. Ciphertext is the encoded, unreadable text. Algorithm is the method for transforming one to the other. And the key is a secret string used as an algorithm seed. So a symmetric encryption algorithm. Uh, you played with this even as a kid. A is 1, B is 2. Uh, the little smiley-faced pile of poop is C. Uh, I really don't want to know what kind of codes kids today are going to come up with, with emojis and whatnot. But mm -hmm. uh, the nice thing about symmetric algorithms is they're very fast. Especially if you're a computer, you, you rip right through this. Oh, they're, they're not as secure. Uh, so long as you have a way to transfer the key back and forth securely, and so long as you don't use the symmetric algorithm for too long, it's pretty secure. Um, asymmetric is uh, the result of the fact that math gets really, really weird at really big numbers. Uh, you have a different method to encrypt and decrypt messages. Uh, and a different key. Two keys, each is used in one stage of the process. Uh, asymmetric seems often much more secure than symmetric, but it is slow. It is hard to churn through these big numbers. <clears throat> Public key encryption is built on top of asymmetric. Uh, you have two keys and you give one of them away. You put it on your web page. You hand it out to everyone in the world. You spray paint it on the wall and have to do community service to clean the wall. <laughs> the other key you keep very, very secret. And since you can use either key to either decrypt or encrypt so long as the other key is used to reverse the process, uh, this means that you can securely exchange information with anyone within the limits of uh, the message exchange mechanism. We have a whole bunch of message exchange mechanisms like SSH, uh, SSL, PGP. All of these are built on asymmetric encryption and there are many different asymmetric encryption algorithms. <coughs> So, SSH uses encryption uh, by using public key encryption for the initial session setup. In this session, they agree on a, a secret to use for symmetric encryption. They exchange a bunch of traffic sym with symmetric encryption, and then they negotiate a new symmetric key. So. Every so often someone says, oh, I hear Blowfish is the best encryption algorithm ever. And they, they prioritize this in their SSH stacks. And they either get broken into uh, their SSH breaks or people laugh at them. The, the algorithms that SSH uses are very carefully chosen and they're chosen in the order that they appear in because of otherwise things go badly. Don't muck around with things like encryption settings. Uh, people who know a lot more math than, well, you know, m maybe not the gentleman from the university, but people who know a lot more math than most, most of us uh, have figured this out. Okay. Let's talk about SSH in particular. The main system-wide configuration files for SSH. SSH underscore config is the host-wide client config for the, the open SSH client uh, on a Unix-style system. Yeah, I noticed that too. I'm sorry? You'll also see a bunch of keys, SSH underscore host underscore something key. The something is the encryption algorithm for that key. Uh, one file is the .pub, that's the public file that gets shared with the world. 
The one that's not labeled pub is secret. Just because it doesn't say secret doesn't mean it's not secret. Uh, check the permissions on these files if you have any doubts. There's also SSHD config, which is the server configuration. Which I'm sure all of you have broken at some point or another. Okay, open SSH server. As I said, I stuffed things into these slides in a hurry yesterday, which means that this is reversed from the previous slide where it should have been. Thank you, Jim. Um, any Unix-like OS today includes OpenSSH. You can also get it for Windows, through Sigwin, SSH for Windows. And most interestingly, Microsoft has committed to supporting OpenSSH in .NET. And so, before long, you will be able to type these 40 character Windows commands in quotes after an SSH minus C and execute it on other hosts without logging in. So, I'm going to be a little weird here and start about debugging the SSH daemon before we look at anything you can do with it. Um, sorry? So, the minus F flag to SSHD says, use an alternate configuration file. So what you can do is, you copy your config file off to the side, you make your change, uh, and you can test using this config file without interrupting your main SSH service. Um, and the minus P flag says, run it on an alternate port. So you, you can't run two SSHs on the same port, port 22, but in this example, I've run my test in instance on port 222. Uh, so I can make sure it works before I kick all my users off the system and lock myself out. And um, well, These days with virtual machines, it's not that big a deal, uh, especially with IPMI and such. But how many of you have ever done the drive of shame to the colo in the middle of the night because you locked yourself out of remote management. There's an awful lot of young people in this room. You don't know how good you have it. Um, so, another useful setting that a lot of people miss is minus D, especially with these test configs and on alternate yeah. ports. <coughs> minus D puts SSHD in debugging mode. And it prints out exactly what it is doing. It will show you the, the key exchanges. It will tell you what's happening. So if you have a client that can't connect, you can start SSHD in debugging mode. Uh, it only stays running for one connection. But at the end, when it hangs, it tells you why the client can't connect. And yes, you, you may not understand the message. You may have to, to fall back on to copy and paste into Stack Exchange. Um, but the, the information is there, especially if you're playing with different SSH settings. So here's a few things in general on SSH. SSH comes in two protocol versions, version 1 and version 2. Um, how many of you allow version 1? Only on VMS machines that are really old. Okay, <laughs> VMS, you have a, another whole set of problems. This is the <laughs> first time nobody in the room has raised their hand. You, you can all give yourselves a pat on the back. Uh, another useful option is the allow and deny groups. For example, I run SSH on a lot of machines that have a lot of user accounts. And I don't want anyone with a user account to be able to SSH in. 
On BSD systems, wheel is the group of users who are allowed to use the root password. So, if you don't have the right to become root, you may not SSH into this machine. Because you shouldn't be SSH'd in anyway. Uh, one of the more troublesome options, especially in this day of you know, DevOps and cloud computing and oh, just spin up another virtual machine, uh, is permit root login, allowing someone to SSH in as root. Um, this is generally a bad idea. It is hard to track. Even if it's a single dedicated purpose machine, don't, it, it is terrible practice, especially when even your automated processes can log in as a regular user and run sudo or pfexec or whatever. Now, uh, we were talking about Ansible earlier. I had a, a nice Ansible setup and we had a dedicated user for Ansible. It always ran sudo. Uh, it can be done. Don't be lazy. And lastly, use DNS. This seems like a nice thing where it shows up in the log that, oh, it wasn't this IP that logged in, it was this host name. And that seems nice, except when your DNS breaks, all of your SSH logins get really, really slow because the DNS query has to time out. And this is particularly pernicious if you're trying to SSH into the DNS server so you can fix DNS. Um, host names are easily spoofed anyway. Don't use DNS in your SSH D config. On the client side, it's fine. If your SSH client doesn't have DNS, well, if you're supposed to be fixing the DNS, you probably know the IP of your DNS server. This is a number that is probably burned into your soul through repeated trauma. Okay. One of the more confusing things uh, that people seem to find useful is Restricting and controlling access by users and groups. I've never given an hour and a half to two hour talk before, so I have to keep a bit of an eye on the time, I'm afraid. Okay. The deny allow users and deny allow groups is very, very useful especially on these machines where, uh, say you get your users from LDAP. You may have thousands of users available on the system, but you only want a really tiny number of people to get in this particular system. And what's more, the list of people on this particular system is probably slightly different from every other system. Uh, we all talk about the joy of having identical machines, and they're really, really hard to achieve. So, roles in SSHD config are uh, processed in order, listed in the config file. And the first match wins. You have the, these four keywords, deny users, allow users, deny groups, and allow groups. So, I have this demo system with just a few users. Uh, Wheel, who are the administrator's staff, who's everybody who works there. Um, the support crew, and the lone guy in billing. So, if I don't want to let the billing people in on this machine, I put one statement in my SSH DPD. Deny users. This guy, he can't get in. And that's nice until you get another billing user. It's much better to deny by groups all the time. 
even if that group only has one user, the day will arrive when you <coughs> add a second user to some other group, and that will save you all the time you spend blocking by groups instead. Allow groups wheel. We touched on that before. But the, the key thing is, if the only access control statement in your SSHD config is an allow statement, that flips SSHD to say, oh, it's default deny. Normally, everyone can get in, but if you make a point of saying that, say, Jeff may log in, and you just lift, list Jeff, well, you obviously mean nobody else. <laughs> so, we've got a special case where the user, PK Dick, is simply not allowed to log into this machine ever again. He was bad last time, and, and no, no. But he's part of the support group. So I put a rule in first that says deny this one user who is on my pool list. And then I specifically allow the support group in. So, you can also restrict users by IP address, which is very useful for processes like rsync. rsync is one of those troublesome things that's really useful, but it wants to run as root. You have to have some sudo in there. You really don't want this account just able to log in from anywhere. So, you lock it down to this one IP address. This one account on this one machine. Uh, you can use host names, but again, when DNS breaks, you're kind of host. You can also do conditional configuration. Uh, on a bunch of my machines, for various reasons, uh, I wanted X11 forwarding. Does anybody else here use Emacs? Okay, you understand. <laughs> I don't want other, it, I'm okay with Emacs, but if I just turn on X11 forwarding unconditionally, um, some dumbass goes and runs Wireshark, gets the box rooted, and I have to go deliver a beating. I don't really mind delivering beatings, but you know, my hands get sore. So, I can use X11 forwarding, mm -hmm. nobody else. So, let's talk about protecting SSHD. The internet is full of SSH servers facing the public internet. Um, how many of you have heard of the Hail Mary cloud? Of course, Jeff has. We see um, it all the time. Yes. Yeah. You, and everyone who looks at their logs here for a How many of you run SSH servers on the public internet? Okay. The Hail Mary cloud is the thing that logs into your server and tries brute force guessing passwords. And you get a few logins from one IP, a few logins from a different IP, it is coordinated and distributed. So all of, the, all of these systems that say, oh, you can only try six times and then we block your IP, that's fine. The Hail Mary cloud moves on to the next bot and keeps attacking. And yes, it's a long shot. There's a reason why it's called the Hail Mary cloud. But a surprising number of machines get broken into by this thing. If you have username and password, uh, if you permit username and password authentication on your host, this thing is going to poke at you forever. And given forever, they can break into your machine. So, this is a problem. Now, the, the way around this is to disable passwords. Recent versions of, by recent I mean like 10 years or so, 
Uh, but there are bots running out there that are older. Um, recent versions will connect to an SSH server and say, oh, you only allow key-based authentication. Never mind. And they go away. They give up. I like it when people give up and walk away. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about key-based auth in a moment. Privilege separation. OpenSSH in particular uh, has to deal with a, a specific problem. Any Unix service that binds to a port 1024 or below has to deal with this problem. It needs root privilege to attach to that port. So it's listening to the network as root. Um, this means anyone who breaks into it has broken into a root level process they own your machine. What OpenSSH does is something called privilege separation. It, it starts as root. It attaches to the port. And only the part that needs to listen to the network runs as root. And that's a very small, small piece of code, carefully audited. Um, and there are a lot of people who want to break that code. So whenever a connection request comes in, it hands it off to a, an unprivileged process that handles the user log. Um, for your own SSH service, if the world doesn't need to connect to it, why let the world connect to it? Um, use a packet filter. SSH, open SSH respects TCP wrappers on most Unix-like systems. Now, if, if it's your company hosts, restrict it to only allowing connections from your company, from your VPN. Don't don't welcome the world into your SSH port. That's how you catch things. Okay, and one common protection is to change the port that SSH runs on. Um, the Hail Mary cloud pokes at other ports. I've run SSH servers on other ports and eventually they will find you and they start poking. Not only do they poke, but they uh, there are services that go probe, you know, yes. systems and say, "Oh, this thing's listening to an SSH." They don't actually have to hit your server. Someone else hit your server and yes. recorded that for posterity, and yes. then you get them. lots of ways to find that out. Now, in all fairness, I run an SSH server <coughs> that listens on. Uh, let me see, port twenty-five, port eighty, port four four five. Port 23, um, and a whole, uh, 110, a whole bunch of other ports. This machine's entire function is to listen to about 200 SSH ports so that when I'm behind almost any naive firewall, yeah. I'm out. Um, this is why you really shouldn't hire me. This is why I'm a full-time writer now. It, it's just happier for everybody involved. <laughs> so, how many PuTTY users have we got in the room? Okay, how many OpenSSH client users? What do the rest of you use? Mobile external. Well, external, yeah, okay. Open SSH. Mobile, mobile extra. Oh, mobile extra. Oh, right. Okay. Apps on phones. <laughs> yeah, apps on phones. If you're an Android user, uh, Connect Bot. Like EX Connect Bot. EX Connect Bot. Yeah. 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 Yes. Paraterm on Windows. Yes. There was also just a recent PuTTY uh, security patch. 0 0.66 is out now. Yes. Yep. Uh, PuTTY does not update itself. Please update your putty. Windows putty design. Windows putty. Okay. So we're, we're about half and half. I'm going to try to give equal attention to both. Okay. Server keys. You connect to an SSH server for the first time. 
and you get this notice that says, hi, here is the key to your server. Please verify this you know, 256 character hexadecimal string of gibberish.